very much, John, for agreeing uh, to give the seminar. Next week, we're going to have Roger Sunahara uh, from UCSD. Uh, Roger was with Gilman, one of the um, really discoverer of cheap protein signaling and make many, many uh, contributions over time. Uh, as you know, Gilman is no more with us, but Roger is continuing his uh, wonderful research. And today we have a very special, uh, a beautiful John Flannery. He is an extremely old friend of mine. I mean, uh, we know each other for a long time, I would say. And uh, John's favorite thing to do with me is to buy me a cognac whenever we go to a meeting. And that's why I love him. All right, with that, uh, let's go to Elliot to do a formal introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Fulinari. Dr. Fulinari is a professor in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley. He received a Bachelor's of Art and PhD degree in Neuroscience at UC Santa Barbara. And he went to UCLA for his postdoc training. In 1991, he became an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Neuroscience at the University of Florida. Since 1994, he has been a faculty at UC Berkeley. His lab has been at the forefront of two fields, gene therapy for inherited retinal disease and development of next generation viral vectors. His team also studies the retinal physiology and pathophysiology to develop therapeutics. Recently, his team successfully employed the optogenetic tool for restoration of vision in a mouse model. Dr. Flannery has published a number of high profile publications and published over 150 articles he serves as vice chairman for two charities, the Foundation Fighting Blindness and Fighting Blindness in Ireland. With this, please welcome Dr. Flannery. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Um, it's a little intimidated to follow Anand and uh, Jeremy Nathans and David Williams, but I'll try. Um, Chris was really good about not telling me who I was following, so I wouldn't be intimidated too much. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Can you see that? No. 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 How about now? <clears throat> Getting there. Almost there. Yes. Yes. Good. How about now? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. And uh, I'm going to talk a couple about um, a couple of projects we're currently doing in the lab, um, which are the topics that was uh, kindly mentioned in the introduction. They're uh, designing uh, improved viral vectors for gene therapy. And then I'll move on to two um, applications that we're exploring using these tools. Um, please, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions during the talk. Um, sort of as introduction, I'd like to start with the fact that uh, sort of outlining the problem of designing a therapy for uh, inherited retinal disease and that um, the landscape is really changing very quickly. You can see from this uh, graph on the left hand side that um, the people who are identifying the disease genes from patients are being a little bit too successful, perhaps, because there's now over 300 different uh, identified gene mutations that can cause inherited blindness. Um, in the late 80s, when the first one, P23H rhodopsin, was discovered, um, people thought, oh, it's great, you know, we've discovered the RP gene, now we can go about our job of fixing it. Um, the people that do the cloning and the patient uh, genotyping have been a little bit too successful now. 
But I think if you look at this curve optimistically, it looks like we're getting to a point where um, most of the large families with multi-generational uh, inherited blindness have been identified. So it looks like it's beginning to plateau. It's probably not going to be a thousand, uh, maybe a couple more hundred. Now that you uh, have this large amount of genetic information about what causes blindness, um, you can look at what the prote proteins that those identified gene mutations encode. And on the pie chart, you can see that almost any biochemical mechanism you can think of has a subset of patients that have a defect in it. Um, there are ciliopathies, there's mitochondrial defects, there's trafficking defects, et cetera. So these two principles make designing a uh, overarching gene therapy for most patients really challenging. If you look at the anatomy, um, this is from a human donor eye. It was a teenager who died uh, uh, at a very young, young age, 17, um, that had a rhodopsin mutation. You can see the typical uh, inherited retinal degeneration phenotype is that uh, on the upper left-hand panel, you can see the fovea. The fovea is relatively uh, spared in this patient. And if you move to the middle panel, a little bit outside of the macula, you start to see a very disorganized pattern where the outer segments are shortened and disrupted. And then on the far right panel, you can see what happens in the equatorial retina on the periphery and that you see that there's large numbers of photoreceptors that have basically no outer segment. Um, there's very short little stubs of degenerating photoreceptor outer segments. In some other conditions, the gene defect is not in the photoreceptors. The majority of the ones that are in that pie chart and in that uh, graph from Steve Dager's lab, about 90 or 95% of those initially kill rod photoreceptors. But a small subset, a couple percent, actually have a defect in the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, the most well-known of these is labor congenital amaurosis type 2, where the defect is in the retinoid isomerase in the RPE, and choroideremia. In this case, uh, REP1 defects in choroideremia kill the RPE. But in general, the phenotype anatomically in the patients is not that different from having a photoreceptor defect. This is a choroideremia uh, carrier, and on the upper left-hand panel, you can see in this woman's eye in areas where the choroideremia defect was not expressed and the RPE is surviving, you see very good organized uh, photoreceptors underlying that RPE. In the middle panel, you can see an area where there's patchy RPE in, on the left-hand side and basically naked Brooks membrane in the middle. You can see where there's RPE underneath it, there's relatively well-preserved photoreceptors. When the RPE is atrophic, you start losing photoreceptors. <clears throat> this is even better uh, illustrated in the two panels on the right, where you can see sort of the edge of where there's RPE and the photoreceptors are dying. And then the bottom right, you can see there's no photoreceptors. You can just see the inner retina laminated up against uh, Brooks membrane. So to summarize, Almost all of the identified gene defects, with a few exceptions, initially kill photoreceptors. And the blindness um, comes from the fact that uh, patients lose their photoreceptors, initially their rods and then later their cones. And the rest of the retinal neurons are basically generated, uh, genetically engineered to not be light sensitive and to be transparent. And so they may survive for many, many decades after the patients are uh, clinically blind or have no light perception because if they survive even in a functional state, they don't respond to light, except with a few exceptions, uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, uh, which entrain your circadian rhythm, have melanopsin. So here's a diagram, another way to look at the same problem from uh, Sam Jacobson. And what Sam is showing here is that depending on what stage of the disease the patient presents at or what, what stage of the disease you're designing the therapy for, the kind of therapies that would work or would not work are somewhat dictated by the integrity of the retina. So on the left-hand panel, what Sam's showing is that in a very early stage patient where there's very good photoreceptor rod and cone integrity, and you know what the defect is, and you have the toolbox to fix it, Certainly the most elegant and probably the most effective thing to do is to correct the dysfunction. So in uh, therapeutics for RPE65, for example, 
putting back a normal copy of the retinoid isomerase enzyme is certainly the best thing to do. However, as the disease progresses, and this can be at different ages depending on what mutation you have, some are faster and some are slower, many patients, the retina actually gets thicker from edema. But in this case, there's still many surviving photoreceptors. And in the middle panels, you see there's progressively less photoreceptors, but there's still significant numbers of photoreceptors. So in those stages, the therapeutic options are still either repair the defect, but as you get progressively towards the anatomical phenotype on the right, in the far right, you see there's just Mueller glia and inner retina against the RBE. Even if you have the tools and you know what gene to fix, that's really not an option because there's no photoreceptors there to put the gene back into and rescue them. So in this case, on the far right uh, phenotype, the options are either generate new photoreceptors from stem cells or from transplants, or um, what I'll talk about in the last fraction of the talk is uh, add a new light sensing function to the inner retinal neurons that are normally not light sensitive to make them light sensitive. So one question in the field of looking at therapeutics is that certainly the first uh, genetic therapy for any inherited disease has been uh, quite a landmark is uh, spark therapeutics, which is now Roche gene therapy treatment for RPE65 LCA. Uh, the treatment here is a subretinal injection of AAV2 with a wild type copy of the DNA for the retinoid isomerase. Um, it's depending on the country, $800,000 per patient. So one question we ask in the lab is, you know, why is this expensive? One of the reasons is that this particular therapy requires a complicated surgical uh, procedure. It has to be done in an operating room by a retina surgeon. It's a subretinal injection. Um, the other problem is that, or the other thing, reason that it works so well is that it's very specific. It's putting back the exact uh, recessive null defect, the exact enzyme the patients are missing. Um, and there's only a few thousand patients uh, in the United States, for example, that are uh, eligible for this because they have to have that exact mutation. If they don't have that, this therapy isn't going to help them. And also some of those patients, even though they may genetically be candidates, they may be too late in disease to have photoreceptors and RPE left to repair. In addition, on top of that, um, in order to make a GMP clinically available and uh, FDA approved product, it's uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to make the product and to run the requisite phase one, two, three clinical trials. So in one sense, you're dividing this cost of hundreds of millions of dollars into a few thousand patients. That makes the idea of making 300 gene specific defects for all the identified mutations uh, economically pretty much uh, a non-starter. So one of the things we've been thinking about in the lab is, you know, is there ways to make this uh, more available and less expensive? Uh, one of the things is that maybe we can use an uh, approach that's not as complicated and get away from the complicated subretinal and procedure that requires an anesthesiologist, a retina surgeon, in an operating room, and do something more like is done with Lucentis every day in thousands of patients, uh, intravitreal injection. Then if we can solve that problem or make a dent in it, can we design therapies that are not uh, mutation specific, something that's mutation agnostic? What we mean by that is that even though replacing the RP65 with a normal copy is really elegant, as I said, it's only appropriate for a small number of patients. So can you design something that works that isn't uh, gene replacement or gene editing? So I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, mutation independent therapies for late stage diseases, sorry, uh, and then for patients that are in the very late stages, perhaps um, adding a light receptive function to uh, their inner retina cells instead of trying to fix their photoreceptor RPE defect. So as I said, um, gene replacement therapy clinically now in all the clinical trials that I'm aware of, with a few exceptions, requires a subretinal injection. In this diagram, you can see the intravitreal approach, which is much simpler because the surgeon basically puts the needle and injects the lucentis or the other reagent into the vitreous. But in order to do a subretinal injection, the surgeon has to go through the retina, making a retinotomy, 
and make a, what we call a blab, a bubble between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. So there's pros and cons of these two approaches. Um, the intravitreal approach, as I'll show you in a second, has the advantage that you can inject a larger volume and that whatever you inject can go to a larger area of the retina. It's much less invasive. Um, one of the contraindications is that it may be more prone to causing a immune response because you're likely to try to inject more uh, virus or more of your drug, which could be more antigen. Also, whatever you inject in the vitreous is more likely to get out through the trabecular meshwork, and that can be a cause of inflammation and uveitis. On the other side, however, for something like a macular disease or a foveal disease or X-linked retinoschisis where the retina anatomy is not intact, it's probably unwise to detach the macula and the fovea from the RPE if you don't have to. Um, surprisingly, for the three that I know of trials for neovascular uh, age-related macular degeneration, which is characterized by choroidal neovascularization, where blood vessels grow from the choroid through the RPE into the subretinal space, those three uh, gene therapy trials to block VEGF actually do use subretinal in injection, which is detaching in this area of the new uh, weak blood vessels. Um, in Adverum, for example, trial, they're going to try to switch in the phase two of this trial to get away from that to do intravitreal. So um, to reiterate, this is the diagram um, of a subretinal injection where you see the needle goes from the uh, limbus through the vitreous through the retina and makes a detachment. You can see here a, a pleb. The size of the detachment is directly proportional to the amount of volume that the surgeon injects. And our lab and many other labs have shown, in addition, what happens is that if you mark the edge of this pleb, the therapeutic agent, particularly the virus, doesn't percolate any further than the edge of the pleb. So it would have been nice if it percolated through the subretinal space and treated a bigger area. But if you look at the circumference of the, the detachment, that's the area that you get um, gene expression in. And that's shown in the two panels on the right where we put a ubiquitous promiscuous promoter CMV or CAG uh, in a AAV virus, a generic AAV virus expressing GFP. And on a mouse, if you see a subretinal injection, you see this sort of random shape uh, green expressing area at the top of the picture. And that's the area of the original pleb, and that's the area of the GFP expression. If you take the same virus um, with the same volume and the same promoter, and you inject it in the vitreous, what you see is a much broader, uh, more uniform expression, basically over the entire fundus in a mouse. However, it's really important to remember here is that even though you see lots of GFP in both examples, the GFP in the lower panel is retinal ganglion cell expression, whereas the GFP expression in the upper panel is photoreceptors and RPE. Another example of this is that um, if you use the same virus and you switch species, the virus tropism, that is what cells it chooses to infect for a particular virus, will be very different when you change from mouse, in this case, to a macaque. So I'll show you again on the left hand side the uh, pan retinal expression in the mouse retina, where it's the ganglion cells all over the place. If you take the same virus and you inject uh, equivalent volume for the size of the eye into a macaque, what you see is a very, very different pattern. What you see is this green ring or donut around the fovea and macula, and you see this pattern of lines. And what you're seeing here, I had to go back to my anatomy text and look, is that these are the ganglion cells that are in the thinning of the primate fovea, the macular pit. So the virus seems to get expression in the area where the retina is thinner, and then when it's expressing GFP, which is free in the cell, um, you see it filling the axons of those ganglion cells as they go to the optic nerve. So there's regions that are highly expressed, basically where the retina is thinner. And then there's other regions, there's a big dark area of equatorial retina where you see very little transfection. So to summarize, um, intravitreal injection of naturally occurring viruses that people didn't engineer in the lab, but they recovered from uh, patient serum or from patient tissues, AAV variants 
that are naturally occurring, if they're put in the intravitreal space, they basically infect retinal ganglion cells, and that's about it. Um, if you take the same virus with the same serotype and the same promoter and you just move it to the subretinal space, luckily for the field, without any engineering, it's quite good at infecting photoreceptors and RPE. But if you look at this um, sort of as an anatomical view, neither route transfects any retina in, in the middle, in the horizontal, bipolar, amacrine cell layer. So the subretinal root doesn't get very far towards the vitreous. So it doesn't infect bipolar cells, for example, very well from that side. Similarly, the virus doesn't get very far. If you put it on the vitreous side, it gets to the ganglion cells, and that's about it. So it goes to sort of the cells that it touches, and that's about as far as you get transfection. So that's the explanation for the fact that Almost all the clinical trials now that are treating patients use subretinal injection because the gene defects they're attempting to fix in most cases are photoreceptors or RPE defects. And the way to get to those cells is to put the needle and the reagent next to those cells. So there's quite a few um, different clinical trials that are either started or planned for retinal dystrophies using viruses. Primarily, people are using no associated virus. In a second, I'll show you why. Um, they're for mostly photoreceptor-specific recessive null diseases. And so the reason for that is that it's much easier if the patient doesn't make a toxic misfolded protein and they're just not making something, like they're not making retinoid isomerase, to give them a wild-type copy of that. It's a relatively straightforward uh, gene therapy. And that's what's being done for Stargardt's disease, for choroideremia and LCA2. Um, there's a test for uh, defects in the bipolar cells and congenital stationary night blindness. There's three companies that are trying to put the basically the DNA for Ilea or, or Lucentis, um, which are anti-VEGF reagents. Um, and in those, the majority of them are still in a subretinal space. And um, there's a group, there's actually two groups that are looking at mitochondrial defects in retinal ganglion cells for labor congenital optic neuropathy. Encouragingly, none of these trials have reported any what the FDA calls adverse events. Large unmanageable uveitis, uh, unmanageable retinal detachment, et cetera. And none of these trials have been stopped for any uh, toxicity or adverse conditions. One question we asked in the lab is, um, do you really need subretinal injection? So when we first started looking at this and talking to people that should know about it, um, I heard many, many things over the course of maybe 10 years ago. One is that uh, people thought the virus vector was too big to get between the retinal cells to the photoreceptors and the RPE, but AV is really only 20 nanometers. And if you look at the anatomy of the retina by EM, the spaces between the cells look like maybe they're big enough. But you have to remember that when you fix tissue for electron microscopy, all the cells have a tendency to swell. And that makes the spaces between the retinal cells look smaller than they really are. Uh, when I first came to Berkeley in the UCSF lab of Roy Steinberg, uh, guy uh, Chester Karwaski, who was visiting, made electrode measurements of the retina by just pushing the electrode through the retina and measuring the resistance. And the resistance that he measured is basically zero, showing that the spaces between the retinal cells are actually quite significant and that particles can move between the cells quite freely. Uh, a few years ago, Denise Delcara in the lab did an interesting experiment just to look at this, where she fluorescently labeled the outside capsid with uh, Psi 3 or fluorescein and put the viruses in a normal mouse and just see where they go. And she found that the AAV particles can actually percolate through the retina quite well, all the way to the subretinal space in the RPE without anything. So there doesn't look like there's much of a barrier. However, if I go back to that picture of the, the macaque, you, didn't, you saw that that didn't really happen very much. You saw it in the center. Uh, where the retina is thin, but you didn't see it uh, very many other places. So when we looked at that, what we found is that the interlimiting membrane, 
which is a basement membrane between the vitreous and the ganglion cell layer, is really full of heparin sulfate proteoglycan, <clears throat> and it's anatomically somewhat thick. And we know that particularly AAV2, which is the most common uh, AAV used for uh, patient trials in any disease, which was not genetically engineered, it was isolated from patients. What it does for a living is it tries to get in as many cells as possible. And so it looks for very common receptors and what it binds to extremely well is heparin sulfate glycan, which is a major co component of the ILM. Mice really don't have much of an ILM. And so when you saw lots of transection in mice, it's because they have an extremely thin uh, ILM. But if you move to canines or cats or pigs or primates, they have a much more robust ILM with lots of heparin sulfate proteoglycan. So what appears to be happening is that it's not that the particles are too small or they couldn't get through the retina. They just find plenty of stuff to stick through from the vitreous right at the beginning at the ganglion cell ILM area. Okay, thanks. Is there a question? Okay, another thing, uh, Jeremy mentioned ophthalmologists from the 1800s. I'm not qualified to do that. But David Williams mentioned uh, experiments that he saw and participated in when he was in Steve Fisher's lab. And I was in Steve Fisher's lab at the same time. Um, and this is an experiment that I always remember. Uh, Steve was trying to look at the formation of new discs. And initially, he wanted to look at just what the first couple of discs looked like. But when he looked in fetal retina, no matter the species, the first discs in the developing retina are very abnormal. They don't look anything like mature discs. So then the lab uh, embarked on a set of experiments of making retinal detachments. And the idea was to uh, have the outer segments be taken away or destroyed from the inner segment and then have them grow back in a mature, not developing retina. So you can look at the first couple discs. And they did these experiments by making detachments of relatively different amounts of time, putting hyaluronic acid in the subretinal space to keep it detached, and then look, see what would happen. And what they found, which was sort of surprising, which stuck with me is that in a lot of diagrams, you see the apposition of the photoreceptors to the retinal pigment epithelium is a very sort of straightforward thing. But if you look like in these pictures they took by electron microscopy, it's actually very elaborate, particularly in the primate. So in the upper, left-hand corner, you can see, this is a view if you were a nucleus of an RPE cell looking down. The next couple panels are more traditional uh, cross-sections, but what you can appreciate in all these panels is that what Steve called it at the time, it's like a Chinese finger trap in that the cone has a very elaborate, detailed, long uh, interdigitation with the retinal pigment epithelium, and that when you make a retinal detachment, should, they're not shown here, this apposition, which is very important for exchange of metabolites and chromophore and oxygen, is disrupted and really never comes back. The RPE apical processes, these very elaborate uh, lamellopodia, retract back into the RPE. The photoreceptors lose outer segments. They typically grow back, but this apposition really never comes back to normal. So for these reasons, I think if you can design a genetic therapy that doesn't disrupt this, particularly in the fovea and the macula, um, I think that would be better. So looking more at the uh, other barriers to intravitreal injection, uh, Denise looked at the fact that the ILM, as we thought, was full of uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycan. It sort of makes sense. Um, when people make clinical grade AAV2 for cystic fibrosis or other diseases, the last step of the purification process is actually a heparin column. It's an incredibly good way to pull out AAV2 from the preparation. And that's sort of an explanation for one of the things we see from intravitreal injection is that the AAV2 naturally occurring serotype particles, which aren't engineered, they bind to this common, uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycan, and they don't get into the retina because uh, it's not that the spaces are too small. They're just all taken up by this. So the titer basically crashes um, right there at the beginning. Um, another summary is that 
gene therapy for ophthalmology had, so far, as I said earlier, has been remarkably successful. Over 250 eyes have been injected with AAV in a couple cases for Stargardt's lentivirus. And so far, knock on wood, there hasn't been any adverse event reports. That suggests that um, the delivery system and the surgery and the gene transfer overall is safe. And the FDA is getting to be more comfortable as more groups uh, approach the FDA with a proposal. The amount of uh, problems that they are looking for up front is getting to be easier. So the pathway, luckily, is getting easier than it was in the first case. OK, so in summary, this slide shows the cell biology of what the gene delivery system using AAV uh, works like. So the virus capsid, the outside coat, looks for a cell surface receptor. And this interaction between the virus and the cell surface receptor is what we call a tropism. It determines what cells are transfected and which cells are not transfected. And it's a very specific interaction. One way to think of this is that there's hundreds of different naturally occurring AAV serotypes um, that can be identified and isolated. And many of them are like uh, other small animals in nature. They're looking for their own ecological niche so they don't have to compete with all the other AAV types. So many of them are looking for different cell surface receptors so that they can get into different subsets of cells. Some are looking for really common ones like heparin sulfate proteoglycan. Other ones are looking for rarer ones. So one thing that's interesting is that, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is that one of the first thing you can do to decide where your gene therapy goes is, of course, whether you put it in the vitreous or whether you put it in the subretinal space. But the second one, after you've decided where the particles go, is to try to uh, adjust or engineer this transfection step between the virus and the cell surface receptor. After that is initiated, the virus is taken into the cell. It goes into an endosome. The virus uh, shell is taken off. And if it's successful, the DNA that's in the AAV or the RNA that's in the lentivirus goes into the nucleus. Um, this is one of the reasons why the viruses work very well and they're very efficient compared to uh, uh, liposomes, for example, or nanoparticles, is that the cell and the virus have sort of uh, evolved together and that this capsid uh, protects the DNA until it gets very far in the uh, endocytosis process. And then at the last stage, the DNA is taken into the nucleus. Um, the virus is extremely good at making an episome. And uh, it goes into the nucleus and it goes into a latent phase and it stays there. It doesn't integrate uh, into the chromosome of the cell. It makes a little circular endosome and that's why it persists. Hopefully, if this is all done correctly, then it makes message, then it makes your therapeutic protein or CRISPR, and that that's secreted from the cell. So if you look at the inside of the virus, one of the reasons why many groups are using AAV, it has advantages and has disadvantages. The advantage is that its wild type genome is quite simple. It's a 4,700 basis, 4.7 kb. And in the naturally occurring state, which is shown at the top, it really only has two genes. The blue one is rep. It's the instructions for replicating. For a gene therapy virus, you don't want it to replicate, so you take that out. Uh, the pink one is cap, which is the uh, instructions for making the surface, the capsid. The capsid is really, in AAV, only three proteins, it's about 50 copies of viral protein one, 50 copies of viral protein two, in a lower number, about a dozen copies of VP3. So even though this crystalline structure in the upper right-hand corner looks really elegant, it's a beautiful crystal of basically three proteins. At the middle panel, you can see at C, what you do when you're making a therapeutic agent is that you take out the rep and cap. You don't need those. You're going to put in those uh, in the production step as plasmids. And that gives you room because you still have to stay within the normal size, uh, 4.7 kb, to put in a cell-specific promoter and then your transgene and then a poly-A or WPRE or some other signal. But also what's critically important is that these little hairpins at the end, which are called the ITRs or inverted terminal repeats, those are critical to maintain because those loop around and stick to each other. And that's critical for making an episome. 
if you don't retain both of those, you don't get a circularizing of the AV insert in the nucleus and expression lasts for a week or two and then the cell destroys it. So the next part of the talk is the work of two very talented postdocs, uh, Denise Talcara in the middle and uh, Leah Byrne. This is a picture when we used to be able to travel about a year ago, the 10th anniversary of the I Institute in Paris. And uh, Jose Sell has been very kind to my lab and that he hired Denise to go to Paris and he recently hired Leah to go to his other job in Pittsburgh. And Jose is the chairman in both places. So he's supervising them remotely traveling back and forth. So what Denise and Leah did um, about a decade ago is try to design new therapies by a method that our collaborator in chemical engineering, David Schaefer, called directed evolution. The idea is that rather than let evolution make modifications or optimizations of viruses and then identify them by pulling them out of patients, um, start from scratch and make as many combinations of changes, and this are changes in the these three proteins that make up the capsid, make as many changes as you can, and then figure out a way to screen for the ones that are optimized for what you want. And since none of the viruses, at least the A, the and Lenti viruses that have been using uh, for gene therapy were isolated from ocular tissues, the hope is that you can make one that's better optimized for ophthalmology targeting, which in our case is gonna be mostly RPE and photoreceptors than what you can get by something that evolved in nature to bind to liver or kidney or somewhere else. So the idea is at the top, um, they made libraries. And the libraries are millions of combinations of changes in the gene for the capsid. So they're schematized here. Um, in the A panel, we did basically bad PCR and we made every possible mutation throughout the cap gene. The middle one is what we call the shuffled library where we took nine different naturally occurring serotypes, A, B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We kept them at every possible restriction site and then shuffled them back together like a deck of cards. And the third library was people in structural biology had identified a few sites on the outside of the capsid that would tolerate the insertion of a peptide. So we made peptides, we made every possible seven mer that we could make and inserted them um, on that site. We tried eight MERS and for some steric reason, eight MERS didn't work very well. Six MERS work, but seven MERS gave you the most possible combination. So we stayed with that. So between the three of these libraries, there's many millions of non-naturally occurring AAV capsid variants. The next challenging thing is design a screen. So this method could be used for screening in cultured cells or in a column or uh, in an organoid or in a retinal explant, but what we wanted to mimic is as closely as possible the challenge, if you will, for a virus to get to the photoreceptors in the RPE from the vitreous. So we wanted to do this in an eye in vivo because, for example, in a dish with a cultured cell or even in a retinal explant, you can think the viruses could just run around the edge of the explant, for example, and get to the photoreceptors uh, so that's not really what we're looking for. So what we're engineering here is the surface. And so since that time, people have identified lots of the surface residues and many of the loops. Uh, in general, what we found, uh, I don't have time to go in it today, but you can imagine the parts of the virus that are at the outside, the spiky parts, are much more um, important for the interaction of the virus uh, with the cell surface receptor than the valleys and the buried parts. And at some point in the future, we won't have to do hopefully this random shotgun selection where we make millions of variants and screen for them. We'll make targeted mutations in the loops to bind to a particular receptor. But currently, I don't know how to do that. Uh, so we're just going to make as many as possible and we're going to shotgun screen it. So we made quite a few of these. Um, the idea is, for example, for the 7 mer insertion, you can see in the upper left-hand panel, we put the 7 mer insertion into the capsid gene. We do that in a couple different wild-type backbones, AAV2, AAV5, AAV8, AAV9. And so you, those are uh, 7 mers that stick out in regions that are exposed on the surface. And a paper from Denise um, showed 
that one of the ones that we identified, which is currently in clinical trials for anti-VEGF, is called 7M8. Um, it has a big effect on binding heparin sulfate proteoglycan. We didn't engineer that, but that's what the effect is, and that makes sense. Um, one of the first things we found, um, this is uh, from the Shuffled Library. We call it SHH10. Ryan Klimchak identified this. This virus in a mouse, which was identified by going uh, in the mouse retina through six successful rounds of evolution, which is inject the library with millions of variants into a mouse vitreous, then identify the ones that get in uh, to the retina, take those out, take that subset, do it again, narrow it down through six successive generations. Ryan identified this one, and it's completely specific for Mueller cells. It takes a, makes a beautiful picture. So from the vitreous, this one with a ubiquitous promoter will drive expression by uh, finding a receptor in Mueller cells and infect Mueller cells and not neurons and not glia, uh, other glia and not RPE. But overall, back to the original theme, what we're really interested in doing is uh, transfecting photoreceptors. So what we've done uh, more recently is taken these libraries and we've screened them in ways that we couldn't screen in mice. We've screened them in dogs in a collaboration with William Beltran at UPenn and Gus Aguirre. And then after that, we've screened them in primates. And the advantage of uh, doing this in a larger animal is one, you can inject a bigger volume, you can control the surgery better. The other thing is the retina obviously is a lot bigger. So what we can do is we can take out the retina after the transfection and you can make uh, regional punches, which you can see here, from different parts of the periphery, the equatorial retina, the center. And then in addition, what you can do is you can take these punches and you can section them. And this is an idea I got from Vadim, where he uh, was sectioning photoreceptors to look at movement between inner segments and outer segments. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at different layers of the retina by taking these punches and putting them on the cryostat and sectioning them and look and see which viruses are in the ganglion cell layer, the inner retina, the outer nuclear layer, and then the RPE. And that's what's shown here. We make these punches and then we cryosection them. What we do is we take a picture of a section to make sure that we're in the right area and that it's not oblique. And then we take the next section and we uh, isolate the DNA and pull out the viruses that are in that particular section. So what we've done is diagrammed here. We first did it with canine because William and Gus had told us many times that they never found any viruses that they liked uh, for their dog model experiments. So the idea is similar to what we did in the mouse. We took the libraries, we put them in one canine, wild type canine vitreous. Then we uh, wait two weeks for the ones to either get into the parts of the retina that we're interested in or to get destroyed. Then we take a subset of those uh, it's important to remember all the inside of these viruses are wild type AAV2 because what we do is after we identify the ones that are in particular parts of the retina, we have to make more. So they have to be wild type so they're replication competent. So we take a subset of those, we repackage them, we put them into another dog, we go around again, we do this around for six um, rounds of evolution. And since the mouse, we made an improvement where uh, Leah Byrne decided to add a DNA barcode, which is tagged so that you can tell what the capsid modification is. So we read out the barcodes in each step, and then we can tell which ones are getting enriched in the different layers and different regions of the retina. <clears throat> and what you can see here is that, uh, thankfully, as you go through rounds of evolution, there's a lot of uh, extra viruses in the first couple of rounds, but around three, for example, the third canine or the third primate, you start to see convergence. Some are becoming more efficient at transfecting the ganglion cell layer. Other ones are better at penetrating and get to the INL. Some get to the RPE and some get to the photoreceptor layer. So at about round six, we've converged from many millions to a small list of less than 100. <clears throat> Is there a difference between different species? That, for example, very much so. So, so uh, all of this preclinical work on animals uh, has that caveat that ultimately you wanted to use it in, in humans, right? Yes. So, what is the advantage of using dog in this study? Is there any thing that is really positive to use dog rather than rabbit or anything else? <laughs> 
The original reason uh, we used dogs is because Gus and William volunteered to do it for free because they never liked any of the vectors they had. And there's lots of dog models. But um, what we found out afterwards is that dogs are extremely difficult to transfect. They're actually harder to transfect than primates. So they actually may be a higher bar and are a better way to screen than primate because any virus, dog vitreous is really thick, dog ILM is really thick. Um, it may actually be a better screen than primates. But I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Thank you. But to finish your question, initially what happened is when we collaborated with Bill Merrigan works on primates, he only wanted us to send them vectors that worked really good in rodents. When we did that, sometimes they didn't work. So testing them in rodents doesn't tell you it's gonna work in primate. The big question we haven't answered yet is the ones that are good in primate, are they good at, if you go back to rodents? And I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so here's some examples from uh, a recently published paper from Leah and Denise's work, where we in the canine were able to find one. This is William's sense of humor. The one of the ones he likes the best is canine number 16. But you can see in the blue panel on the upper left, the best one that they had at Penn for the canines was AAV2 with some tyrosine mutations to uh, make the infectivity better. And they've got a little tiny bit of infection in this box. And you can see it higher mag in the two panels. It's sparse and it's not very broad. The same virus at the same volume with the same titer with the same promoter with the same reporter gene from the directed evolution screen K916 is dramatically much more efficient. It's a broader area of transfection from the vitreous and more efficient in infecting uh, motor receptors in RPE. Gus is notoriously difficult to please, but he said this one was okay. Okay, so we've gone on from that. Um, we're moving up what we thought was the evolutionary tree to macaques. Uh, we had spent a tremendous amount of money doing this. Uh, we did six rounds of evolution in macaques with the same idea where you're gonna uh, put it in one eye, wait a couple weeks, read out the barcodes from the sections in the different regions, uh, re-inject the ones that are the winners. So sort of a Peloton in the Tour de France, the people in the back of the Peloton get dropped off each week and that the winners go on. So here's from our recent paper that Leah and Denise published in J. Quinn Invest. Here's the ranking of the variants by reading out the barcodes in the primate retina from the different regions. And most of the ones that did very well are from uh, the peptide insertion library in this case. Um, there's different ones with different peptide sequences. We don't know yet what this means. We do know that it does uh, decrease the heparin sulfate proteoglycan binding. Another set of experiments what we did is we completely ablated the virus binding the heparin sulfate proteoglycan what we found there is that makes it extremely good at getting all the way through the retina to the subretinal space. But if you do that, it doesn't infect any cells. So we sort of shot ourselves in the foot that way. So what we think now at an early level is what we're doing here is we're decreasing the heparin binding, but we're not eliminating it. And we're doing some other changes that we don't quite understand that allow it to infect RPE and photoreceptors. So the majority of the ones that have high barcode round counts are either seven were peptide insertion libraries or ones that we swapped the loops on the outside. The shuffled library and the primate didn't do so well. So here's an example of taking some of the winners. Uh, the previous one from the mouse screen, seven of eight is in the middle. And here's one from the primate screen called NHP number nine. You can see that NHP number nine is quite efficient at infecting retinal ganglion cells. And it's also very efficient at infecting foveal cones, where 7M8 is just as good at ganglion cells, but it's not very good at foveal cones. And you can see in the left-hand panel, in some examples of this, it's extremely good at infecting the ganglion cell complement. You can see the axons, the nerve head. That's shown better here. Um, Lee and Denise uh, made two vectors, uh, 7M8, and you can see um, it's very good at infecting ganglion cells, which you can see in red but it's not very good even with a cone specific promoter at infecting foveal cones which you see in the middle and green. Whereas NHP number nine um, is extremely good at infecting foveal cones as you see in the center with GFP. You can see that here in cross sections. Here's a comparison of our best previous one, 7M8 with uh, NHP nine. 
in the two panels on the left, and you can see some examples of it on the right. One other interesting factor that uh, I don't have much time to go into, but you can see in this picture, you see radial patterns in some of the cross sections. What we see is that where there's a Mueller cell, where its end foot is on the vitreat side, or where there's a blood vessel, you can see in panel J, there's a couple blood vessels. It looks like in the equatorial and peripheral retina, that is an access point where maybe the ILM is thinner and the virus gets in there better than some other regions that you see that doesn't have as much GFP expression. So it's still patchy um, with these vectors in the peripheral retina. Okay, so I'd like to switch gears for a second now and show you for the remaining part of the talk two examples of ways that we're using these um, for therapeutics. So the first one is a collaboration with uh, Jose Sahel and Terry Laviard. Um, at IDV Paris, and they discovered quite a while ago a factor called rod-derived cone viability factor, and it explained um, many, many decades of clinical literature where RP patients that had rod-specific disease eventually went blind, even though their cones had no uh, genetic defect. And the original thought many people had was that, well, all the rods are dying, there's more rods than cones, they're polluting the neighborhood, and that all the broken up pieces of all these rods are killing all the normal cones because they're destroying the environment of subretinal space. It's sort of the Detroit theory of ophthalmology. If your neighbor's going to hell and their house is falling down, your house is going to fall down too. But what Terry and Jose found is that it's actually just the opposite, is that there's a factor, rod-derived cone viability factor, that's secreted by rod photoreceptors that's required for cone survival. And that what happens is that in a normal healthy retina, where there's a mixture of rods and cones sharing the same subretinal space, the rods secrete this factor. It binds to a specific receptor, basogen 1, which then controls the glucose uptake in the cone. And that when the rods die, the cones are no longer able to take up glucose. And even if you inject glucose, the cones still die because they don't uh, run their transporter. So um, it's sort of sad because you're, when you're a patient, you're losing your macula and fovea after you've lost all your peripheral rods, and there's no genetic defect. You're just losing this factor. Excuse what, me? What, um, question? Yes, uh, I have a question, Dorota, here. Um, um, this is very interesting. Do you remember if it is stabilizing the structure of GLUT1? Because usually GLUT1 doesn't need the co co uh, co receptors. Um, you would have to go back and look at Terry I will. An Excel paper at the, of the mechanism. Of course, I will. Many pages. Um, Thank you. One question I had is that why would evolution ever design a system like this where the cells were completely dependent on, cone cells were completely dependent on rods? And that one explanation is that in the healthy retina, depending on the light part of the light cycle you're in, whether it's bright or dark, sometimes the rods are working harder and sometimes their cone are working harder. So this system of the cones giving the car keys to the rods keeps them from competing for glucose in the subretinal space. So uh, depending on the state of the lighting, the rods can turn up or turn down the cone metabolism. So in normal retinas, this works really well. They can share. Uh, they don't compete very much for the glucose that's supplied in the subretinal space. But when the defect occurs in the rods and the rods are gone, the supply of RDCVF is gone. So originally, the idea was to make a small molecule RDCVF, which Terry had done many times and shown that in mice that this will lead rescue of cones. However, when they talked to Sanofi, uh, Sanofi tried to make enough to run a clinical trial three different times, and they were unable to do what they call scale up. And I guess this happens like half the time in the pharmaceutical industry. You can make enough to run your experiment in your lab in uh, 50 mice, but when you try to make enough to run a clinical trial in patients, you can't use as pure reagents or something in the purification fails. So it wasn't possible to make enough RDCBF molecule to run a clinical trial. So that's where we thought about maybe we could secrete it um, with a virus vector. So uh, there's two splice variants of RDCBF. There's the short and the long. Uh, 
And Leah Byrne made both of them in virus vectors. And what she found is that if you um, secrete RDCVF, and it looks like it doesn't matter too much where you secrete it from, you can preserve um, the cones in a mouse model of RP. We tried several different uh, mouse models with different mutations. It doesn't seem to matter what the uh, mutation is that causes the death of the rods, but if you uh, secrete RDCVF, the cones will survive. And you can see that with the cone ERG is surviving, whereas the rod ERG is going away. It's better shown here. These are in flat mounts where Leah stained all the cones. You can see if you inject PBS in one eye in the upper panel, or you inject AAV with the 7 of 8 vector from the vitreous to secrete RDCVF, the number of cones that are surviving is dramatically more. Mice only have two kinds of cones. They have an ML cone and an S cone, but both types are almost wild type levels when you secrete the RDCVF. So we think this is an example of something that's uh, mutation agnostic. It could work for patients uh, no matter what their mutation is in a rod photoreceptor disease. Um, it doesn't do anything to help surviving uh, their rods, but I think if you're a patient and you live in a city, keeping your foveal and macular cones around is a reasonable alternative. Uh, we moved on to a collaboration in a larger animal model. This is with Maureen McCall, who has a pig model of RP that has a P23H uh, rhodopsin mutation. And this is the design of the experiment here. Uh, Maureen genetically engineers the piglets. Uh, the piglets have an advantage that it has a human-sized eye and that um, we did the same experiment similar to what we did in the mouse. It's intravitreal AAV 7M8 with a ubiquitous promoter. We first did it with GFP, then we did it with RDCVF. Uh, we do uh, intravitreal injection at postnatal day three, then we do ERGs and OCT imaging and ultimately histology. As you can see here that in the pig model, it actually works almost as well or as well as it does in the mouse and that it preserves the cones quite well and it preserves the cone ERG as well. You can see that here that it's preserving the cone ERG and uh, surviving cones are significantly larger and longer and better preserved and higher in number um, with secreting RDCVF. And that's what's shown here as well. This is Amelia Zinn's immunocytic chemistry showing the treated eye versus the untreated eye. So I'll finish off with uh, one last set of experiments we've been doing, which is for patients that are in such a late stage of the disease that they no longer have any photoreceptors left to rescue. So the idea is to add a new gene instead of a replacement gene to the surviving interretinal cells. And this could be bipolar cells or retinal ganglion cells. These are normally sending the electrical signal. They normally respond to glutamate. They normally don't respond to light, but put in a gene that makes them light sensitive. So several different groups have uh, proposed to do that. And the different proposals are either to add the light receptive function to surviving cone inner segments in patients that don't have rods but they have cones that have inner segments, but no outer segments. And the idea is that if you can make the cone inner segments light sensitive, it would still be hooked up to the bipolar system, the ganglion cell system, and you would get a tremendous amount of rescue uh, vision wise. Uh, the number of patients that have this phenotype is quite small. There's a larger number of patients that have the phenotype that's shown in the middle where they've lost all their rods and cones, but they still have bipolar cells. And the idea would be making the bipolar cells light sensitive. The final one that we pursued the most is that in the latest stage, the patients probably only have retinal ganglion cells uh, that are still connected to the visual cortex and add a light receptive function to the ganglion cells is another option. So the many groups that have tried the different cell targets have also tried different light sensors. The first one was channel rhodopsin. This is a really appealing one because uh, it really only requires transfer of one gene. It's a light sensitive microbial ion channel. So it opens and closes in response to light and it's incredibly fast. Um, people have tried melanopsin and uh, people have engineered different uh, modifications of uh, glutamate receptors, for example, and we've done some of that. Depending on which channel, they have different lambda max. One of the downsides of these Excuse me. Oh, okay. 
no problem. No problem. It's just going to be like. Um, so this is an example that we made a few years ago with Ehud Isakoff in Dirk Trauner's lab, where he engineered a glutamate receptor that had a chemical called BGAG, which connected glutamate sort of to a photoisomerizable string. But what happened is that when you shine light on the system, the glutamate would go into the binding pocket and open the channel, and that when you uh, took away the light, it would sort of do what retinol does. It would open up again and close the channel. And so this is a sort of an engineered light-sensitive glutamate receptor. And what we found is that um, when we did this, we made a virus, we engineered the uh, engineered channel, we expressed it in ganglion cells and bipolar cells, then we added the chemical photosensitizing agent, the glutamate and the isomerizable molecule. In blind RD1 animals, we were able to uh, restore some vision. In a box, you can see here, a mouse can be treated with this reagent and the chemicals added after the gene is expressed. The mouse can learn to go from one side of the box to the other. This doesn't require any particular speed of the visual signal. And it can also recognize simple patterns. You can see we projected uh, cross and parallel lines. In order to uh, avoid a mild foot shock, the animal can learn to move to one side of the box or the other to avoid this. This is a pattern vision recognition and doesn't require any particular speed of the response. So what we found in general, just like other people that had these one component systems is that these single component systems, whether they're channel rhodopsin or engineered glutamate receptors, they suffer from the same problems no matter what they are. They're very, very fast because they're only one component, but they don't have what photoreceptors have, is that they don't have any adaptation. They don't have any gears, if you will, and they don't have any amplification. So they require extremely bright lights to actuate and that um, they may not be usable without some sort of goggles to brighten the light, which may actually be damaging to the retina. So then we switch to something that maybe we should have done in the beginning, is look at what photoreceptors do. And what photoreceptors do is that they separate the light sensor from the ion channel infector. Uh, so the uh, glutamate channels and the, uh, the cyclo G channel, excuse me, is in the plasma membrane. And in between the rhodopsin or the cone option is transducin and PDE. And what this gets you is it gets you amplification and it also gets you something like 10 logs of adaptation. So we thought maybe we'll try to recapitulate what nature designed and design something where the uh, light sensor is separated from the effector. So the first one we did, which is probably what we should have done in the beginning, I said, instead of um, engineering all these tricky m r receptors, why don't we just try rhodopsin? Many, many people told me this could never work because you'd have to put in the whole phototransduction cascade, rhodopsin plus transduction plus PDE plus channel. <laughs> However, we just tried it. And it turns out that GPCRs are remarkably conserved and that if you put rhodopsin in either bipolar cells or in ganglion cells, it will connect up to a GPCR cascade in those cells and modulate the channel. And that's what you can see here is that on the MEA recordings in panel A and panel B, if you express rhodopsin in ganglion cells and you pulse it with the light, this is an RD animal with no photoreceptor, you get no response with the pulses of green light. And then when you add it, uh, the other eye with the rhodopsin gene therapy vector, you see lots of ganglion cells or lots of bipolar cells, depending where you express it, responding every time you hit it with the light. There's a simple water maze we tried, and the animals can do this water maze by putting uh, rhodopsin in their ganglion cells in the absence of having any photoreceptors whatsoever. This task they can do pretty well where they can swim to the platform. They can also do fear conditioning where they can learn to avoid a light flash. But what we were really surprised to find is that even though rhodopsin is extremely fast in photoreceptors, when you ectopically express rhodopsin in ganglion cells or bipolar cells, it's really slow. And we think that's because the kinetics of the GPCR cascade that it's hijacking in those other cells is much slower than the phototransduction cascade. And that's what's shown here is that what we wanted something that mimicked retinal vision with photoreceptors, rods, and cones. So we wanted something that 
adapted over many log units that was not requiring any uh, goggles so that it was very sensitive and that we thought Redoption would fill the bill, but it turns out that it's light sensitive enough to work without any light amplification goggles. But when you ectopically express it, it's really too slow. Animals can do these tasks that don't require any motion vision, but we think if you put it in a patient that they would have to sit still because it doesn't respond very fast. So next that we tried is middle wavelength cone ops. We found that surprisingly, cone ops is 10 times as fast as Redoption in ganglion cells and bipolars, and it's just as sensitive. So we think this is a good trade-off that would allow fast enough vision for you to move around the room and uh, be sensitive enough to work without any external amplification. So what we did here is we made a virus vector we injected in the vitreous with middle wavelength cone opsin. You can see the uninjected uh, eye on the multi-electrode array in panel H. And you can see the RD1 photoreceptorless cone ops and expressing retina uh, with each one of these green bars is a pulse of light. It responds very fast to uh, pulses of light and it's quite sensitive. You can see it here. It's um, 10 times as fast as I said. It can respond to 100 milliseconds and it starts to fail at about 20, 25 or 50 milliseconds. But that's sort of the speed of a video projector. So. Um, Video projectors flicker at 50 hertz, so this is looking like it's fast enough for motion vision in patients with no photoreceptors. So we began to test it in the behavioral systems. The first one we did, as I showed you earlier, is the light avoidance chamber. You put a light on one side, you make two different chambers, one that's light and one that's dark. You put an RD mouse in it, the mouse will spend an equal amount of time in each half of the box because it doesn't know which half is the dark half. Normally sighted mice will spend almost all their time in the dark half of the box because they naturally avoid the light. And when you add rhodopsin or you add cone opsin to these blind animals, they can do this task that doesn't require motion vision equally well, and they can do it almost as well as wild type. We then moved to putting iPads on either side of the box and we made patterns. These are two lines. The difference is that One's parallel and one's vertical, one's horizontal. You can see that in this particular uh, test, which the screen is flickering, the cone ops and animals are performing this discrimination between horizontal versus vertical in panel G, as well as the wild type. We then separated the bars by different distances. The cone ops and ones can perform this task almost as well as wild type. And when you move the bars across the screen, the cone ops and ones are indistinguishable um, from wild type. We wanted to see if having a separation of the sensor and the uh, channel got you some adaptation. We found that we got three log units of adaptation in the system. Uh, we used different background illuminations and we found that it doesn't have nearly as many log units of adaptation as photoreceptors, but it has a couple which probably would give you the ability to move from indoors to outdoors. We've tried some pattern discrimination tasks this is certainly not to be thought of as reading, but if you put a pattern like a V versus a pattern that's a T, which is the same number of pixels on the screen, and you give them animals a, wide, a mild foot shock, they can discriminate the V from the T and move to the appropriate side of the box. You can see here they do it basically as well as wild type animals. You can also do other kinds of pattern discrimination, and they can easily learn this task of discriminating pictures. So the last experiment I'll show you is that this is a chamber that we've built that's probably the chamber we should have built in the beginning. It's a box that you put at normal lab illumination that we've carefully scrubbed so it doesn't have any scent. And uh, we put a blind RD untreated animal in with a couple of novel objects. You can see if I start the video, is that this is an untreated RD1 mouse. And what it does is, probably what I would do if I was in um, an unfamiliar hotel room and I couldn't see, it basically just hugs the wall. And I'll stop it because it just never leaves the side of the chamber for as long as you look, it pretty much never explores the novel objects or the center of the chamber. However, the litter mate RD1 photoreceptor was animal immediately explores the novel objects 
and it moves around the room at what looks like a normal speed. Uh, another way to look at that is just look at the path length of the pattern. You can see here at the top in the orange line, the wild type explores not only the walls, but explores the novel objects. The RD1 basically spends its time hugging the walls with its whiskers as the only sensory input. And the treated RD1 photoreceptorless animal with cone option in the retinal ganglion cells explores as much speed and as much uh, excursions into the center as the wild type animals do. So I'll wrap up there and say, in conclusion, we think that uh, you can engineer AAV vectors to have properties that are better for ophthalmology, which is uh, infect a larger area of the retina and maybe not require subretinal injection, and maybe use less vector. We think that um, when screening them in a macaque, that is as close as we can get, and hopefully those will be usable in a patient. And as far as using these types of vectors as an intravitreal therapy, I gave you two examples. One is secreting rod-derived cone build with liability factor for patients that have rod disease to preserve their cones. And then for patients that are in the late stages where they no longer have any photoreceptors to fix, we think that uh, using cone option as an optogenetic gene replacement in ganglion cells may give these patients some uh, useful motion vision. So I'd like to thank, at the end, all my collaborators that did all the work, including a lot of things I showed you today. The optogenetics are the thesis work of Mike Berry and Benji Gal. Uh, as I said, Leah Byrne and Denise Talcara did most of the vector engineering, as Micah Liesel is the lab manager that we couldn't do anything without, and did an amazing amount of work for all these things. The uh, vector engineering is also uh, part of Tim Day's PhD thesis. Um, that's him in the waiting pool. Um, Amelia Zinn did the RDCVF with Maureen McCall. Uh, the RDCVF project was just the discovery of Jose Sahel and Terry Laviard, and Denise is now working with them in Paris. I'd like to thank Maureen for lots of experiments on the pig models and Bill Merrigan for the primate work. Uh, the dog work for the screen was with uh, William Beltran and Gus Aguirre, and my longtime collaborators on optogenetics and vector engineering are Udi Isakoff and Dave Schaefer. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, John, so much. Uh, any questions? It was wonderful. Can I start? Dorota here. I have one question regarding the, uh, the AAV vectors. Uh, that was actually amazing. And to see the selectivity, it's, it's just so needed in the field. So I wanted to ask whether, um, what is the selectivity of those vectors when you inject them into the developing, re developing retina? Um, I guess it depends on the species. Um, we are just beginning to take the ones that we screen in the dog and in the primate and try them in uh, rodents. We don't know that yet. We haven't certainly haven't tried them in a developing retina. I don't know if there will be better or worse. Um, it would be it would very be interesting. What is the actually binding? Uh, what is the binding receptor, uh, if any, that it's so specific? And maybe it can be done in certain all the other stages. I think it's very interesting uh, to find. Yeah, in a paper that Leah and William just submitted, what they did, which is the next best level of this, is that what we found is when you look at the DNA barcode readout, which is what we used in the Jaclyn and Best paper, that gives you a ranking of how many copies of the DNA there are in the different layers and different regions. But some of the ones in that screen, even though they're very hard, high in the barcode readout, when you take them singly and put them back, they weren't very good. So we think that maybe what's happening is some of those, they have lots of barcode reads, but maybe those are viruses that are in between two cells or they're not expressing, but they're represented at high levels. That just shows some prevalence. So Leah went and she did, uh, for the top many variants from the barcode screen, she then put a reporter GFP and then she read out the message. Then she was able to re-rank those uh, candidates in the new by looking how much they express, and it changes the ranking quite a bit. But to answer Chris's question, I don't know when you switch species um, whether this has to be done for every species or not. 
but we did find that ones that were at the top of the canine screen are very, very good in the primate. And we had sent them to our collaborators in Israel and they were quite good in a sheep model. So okay. it may be what William originally thought is that the dog is a tougher bar than the primate because the vitreous and the ILM and the canine is very difficult to get through for the virus. Thank you. Anybody else? John, I have a question. A great talk as always. Actually, two questions. One is given that you mentioned that you, you and others have done optogenetics with different cell types in the retina in terms of ultimately getting functionality. You know, what cell types do you think would be the best to use? And so a related question is with the directed evolution that uh, you and um, Denise and Leah and others have been doing. Are, are there any variants that are specific for particular retinal ganglion cell subtypes versus other subtypes? Uh, the first question is, uh, talking to people that do retina circuitry, Berkeley and at meetings, many different people who are much more expert at that than I have their own favorite retinal cell. We found that in another study that bipolar cells were a little bit better at restoring vision than ganglion cells, but currently the promoters for bipolar cells aren't as strong as the ones we have for ganglion cells and uh, we get a little bit less expression, so it, it's hard to really tell. Frank Borblin always wants us to do starburst amacrine cells because they cover a broad field and then they input onto many ganglion cells. Um, we don't have any promoters that are amacrine cell specific. Recently, Moody came up with an idea of mixing two viruses together with two different serotypes. What we found is that they would randomly express two different channels that have the opposite polarity in different subpopulations, admittedly randomly, of ganglion cells. And actually we were able to find that the animals had slightly better but measurable vision uh, responses and resolution by putting in mixtures of uh, channels in ganglion cells. So certainly as we get more promoters for subtypes of retinal cells, that's gonna be the area to explore. And how about your project with Chris for looking for the sweater specific variants? How's that coming? Uh, that requires me to fly to Baltimore. <laughs> uh, John, I wanted to thank you. You know, at, at the Gavin Herbert, we're very interested in translational vision research. And all I can say is what you've done is a wonderful example of how uh, translational vision research can work going from viruses to the function of the opsins and, and uh, you know, all that you did. Pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you. John, uh, Hi, John. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, good talk, by the way. And so because you mentioned uh, the, the gene therapy only works on certain species, so what do you think is the best model for study gene therapy? And the second question is that, how about your virus? And will they work on human? Thank you. Um, I mean, the foundation fighting blindness has been a, been a big question. Uh, at one point, we read a grant where people were going to screen big primate colonies for primates that had retinal degenerations. And currently, people have found one for R. Dave Bedell, and people at Davis found one for, I think, achromatopsia. But that's been incredibly uh, unfruitful. The other part of this grant was to just find carrier primates and mate them, in which initially that sounded great. But when you talk to veterinarians, they said, dumbest project ever, because you had to find two different primates of the opposite sex of mating aids that liked each other with the same mutation. If you found that, which you probably wouldn't, you'd have to mate them. Primates don't have litters, so you'd get one, nine months later, you couldn't do an experiment on that one, et cetera, et cetera. It's like a 10 year project to make a primate model of an IRD. Um, what's nice about Maureen's experiment is that Maureen CRISPR edits the pig. And so she can make basically any pig model you can CRISPR edit the sperm of. Uh, she gets litters of pigs a couple months later and you know, it's random, but half of them have the disease and half of them don't. 
pigs amazingly have more cones than people. So they have a human sized eye and the retina surgeon can use all his regular surgery equipment. You can get enough to do an experiment. So I am sort of lending uh, my interest in the great canine models that William have, which are not engineered, they're random. And the engineered models that Maureen made where she can make what she wants. Uh, the primates are gonna be great, uh, but they're really hard to do an experiment on. And uh, like all our experiments are on wild type primates. But to your last question is that, I don't think it's ethical to try these vectors on patients without trying them with a therapeutic. I don't think it's legal or the FDA would let you. So um, we have to collaborate on making one with a therapeutic to test them in a patient. We certainly couldn't run a screen on patients. I also work with uh, Bill Merrigan. I was a postdoc on that lab uh, a week, one year ago. You did both optogenetics and, I mean, this microbial opsin as well as body period opsin, like the MW opsin uh, versus channel opsin or any other uh, microbial opsin. Uh, but I think like um, uh, for the MW opsin or those body period opsin, they need a complex machinery pathways to survive or to work them. Uh, for a long time, but due to the in the degenerate retina, most of those uh, photoreceptors are gone. Have you or do you have any idea how uh, how it would be effective? Uh, up to genetics versus you know, I mean, I'd say microbial opsin versus uh, vertebrate opsin, which would be better in your opinion? We've been collaborating with Bill Merrigan for quite a long time, and uh, we're just started collaborating with the middle wavelength cone opsin with Bill and. Um, what Bill's going to do, which is quite an amazing experiment, is that he's going to test a primate vision psychophysically um, while the virus is expressing the cone opsin in a normal primate with normal photoreceptors. And then he has a mechanism for using a laser to ablate a small amount of the foveal cones. And he measures the psychophysics de defect by uh, removing those photoreceptors. And then he wants to see how much of the vision restoration comes back from the cone opsin in the ganglion cell. So that's going to be a very, very telling experiment. Um, the other interesting thing is that if you look at papers from Sam Jacobson and her sedation at Penn, patients that had subretinal RP65 gene therapy, initially what happens is that they don't really know uh, the sensitivity increase from where the bleb is. It's, the bleb is way outside of the macula. But after about a year and a half, what Art and Sam found is that the patients will switch from the area of the bleb, which is more sensitive because they now have isomerase there, back and forth between there and the fovea, depending on how bright it is. When it's really bright, they go back to the fovea because the resolution's better. Mm -hmm. so when you make it dimmer, they move to this new PRL, the bleb. But that, you know, since it takes a year and a half, I have to think that's a visual cortex thing. So I think for all these therapies, the patients with time, hopefully their brain plasticity will make the result better. That's certainly to be seen. So I mean, uh, your uh, MW opsin is better than CHR2 kind of, I mean, vertebral opsin is better than microbial opsin. The trouble with the microbial opsins and the mel melanopsin is sensitive, but it's extremely slow. It sort of integrates. I mean, its genetic function is to can train your circadian rhythm, so it responds over minutes. It's not fast enough for motion vision, even though it's sensitive enough. The microbial opsins, since they're a light sensitive channel, they don't have any amplification, so they're super fast, faster than you need, but they require tremendous amounts of light sort of like noontime outside uh, lighting. And since they don't adapt, if you go one log below their range, they're off. They just don't gradually go off, they just go off. So we never found any microbial one component systems that have a, win a useful range and speed combination. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, very, very, uh, very much enjoyed the talk. Um, 
So a, ge a general question. Um, so in cases where you have cell-specific trophism, either as a result of capsid uh, mutations in the capsid, like with the SH10s, or using cell-specific mini promoters, how often do you see batch-dependent variation in cellular trophism? And do you know what the cause of that is? You mean from virus batch to virus batch? Exactly. We, we never see, I've never seen batch to batch. What we find is batch to batch um, differences in the titer or the differences of empty to full ratio. Some of the capsids don't have any gene in them. Um, we see animal to animal variation. Gigantic, everybody sees it in a subretinal injection. But we see, we've been doing these vectors in the last couple months in triplicate in primate, wild type primates, and you see uh, efficiency differences with the same vector, with the same titer, by the same surgeon in three primates. But the tropism, we don't see a change. We we have seen very, we have seen with some of the glial vectors, glial specific vectors, we've seen um, we've seen uh, targeting photoreceptors depending on the uh, infection efficiency and mode of delivery. So. Um, I nobody seems to know what the cause of that is. So yeah, we've seen with the SHH10, for example, we do see sometimes it's all glia, and sometimes it's a mixture of neurons and glia, um, depending on the promoter. And sometimes we've seen ones that look like they uh, don't infect glia very well, and some other systems they seem to infect glia. So we've seen that. I don't understand it. Right, we had a wonderful uh, lecture and uh, great questions. Uh, before we go to Kathy for final comments, John, let me have you uh, uh, answer one more question. Uh, so we have the um, RPE65 uh, example of gene transfer and then rescue, uh, very minimum actually rescue of vision in those patients. This is easy, relatively speaking, because you have the uh, enzyme and whether you provide 60%, 50%, 20%, the cell will respond properly and will be happy with that. But uh, once you go to the structural proteins like ABCA4 or peripherin, uh, where you, the dose of the photoreceptor uh, proteins will be extremely critical. And you have example of rhodopsin, right? Where you have uh, over uh, expression of rhodopsin leads to a degeneration. How do you see this uh, to be overcome with the existing technology or something new has to be invented? That's a great question. We've talked to companies a lot about that. Enzymes are really easy target. You know, in the past, we've tried to make animals night blind by getting rid of their vitamin A. They have absolutely huge uh, tolerance for ranges of vitamin A. And you know, with enzymes, you know, if you put back 5% in a lot of cases, you get phenotype correction, that's almost normal. And if the enzymes you overshoot, it doesn't seem to be very toxic. But to your point with structural proteins, usher proteins, many cases, Stargars, for example, you're gonna have to try to hit wild type expression levels, not under, not over. And I think to Seth's point, we like to think it's going to be a combination of engineering the capsid and engineering the promoter that will give you flexibility. But hitting the wild type level is going to be a big challenge. Similarly, in dealing with people that express CRISPRs, with the CRISPR, you know, with a lot of cases, we get editing of 50 or 60 percent, which is not enough editing the correct phenotype. And then, so you don't want the CRISPR hanging around. Because once it does the on-target edit, the longer it expresses, the more off-target edits you make. So you really want the CRISPR to be really efficient for like a week or two and then stop. So there's a lot of engineering to do to, for whether you're doing gene editing or gene replacement uh, to go. So hopefully we're, that we think that engineering the capsid plus promoter selection will give you the ability to get there. But it's going to be a lot of work. Before we go to Kathy, maybe uh, Miss Philip, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. It was a great talk. As somebody who doesn't work in this field directly, it was it was really nice to. It was very educational and seeing what the issues were and how you guys are solving them. Um, mine. I was kind of going back to the initial um, 
problem that you brought up about the about the virus is sticking to the inner limbing membrane. And I was wondering, I, as you were talking, I looked it up. There's been work done with people giving hepatitis and stuff. Is that is that something that is a is a viable option uh, broadly in, in different species? Are you guys using that as a strategy? Yeah, we, right. we we collaborate with Russ Van Gelder and. Uh, he suggested doing an ILM peel, or as you say, there's enzymes that uh, uh, will break up the ILM. The ILM is, you know, one of the reasons people didn't address it much is that it's really not a barrier in rodents, and it's a gigantic barrier in primates and in, and in patients. So, but many people say that we're glaucoma experts. Jeff Goldberg and uh, Jackie Duncan have told me that, you know, peeling the ILM is iatrogenic it does a lot of damage so you want to get around that so we're trying to find vectors that fit around it without an ilm peel but um jason commander did an experiment where he injected the vector under the ilm and the transfection goes like way up so putting it under the ilm makes a big difference but i think surgically if you can get away from that uh, Jeff, you on a microphone. Cut microphone. Seth. Okay, we got Seth on the hot microphone. Now we know what he's doing. Uh, how about Kathy? Are you there? Are you not listening to John Flannery? How can I not be listening? <laughs> All right, so your final word goes to you. That's really frightening. Um, obviously, fantastic work, and I'm my most interested from what we're doing and trying to figure out how, even if it's still doing it in the rodent models, we can get expression from the vitreous and really good transduction from the RPE. So, identifying the with the the the, um, the viruses that you've made, ones that we can stick in the in the vitreous instead, since it's so small. But I think my favorite part was your choice of images for aversion at the uh, in the in the middle. Thanks. <laughs> And with that, it's great work. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. And I hope to see you a week from now uh, with your old friends and, uh, and not friends and everybody else. All right. Ciao. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. David wanted to ask something, but I think he, he gave up. Thank you. <laughs>